This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Stevenson Ministries and the Houston Faith Church family. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said this, He had come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's talking about laboring in the world, laboring uh, in natural matters. Come to, you, come to me who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Or meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So basically, if, you, if you'll get saved, get born again, stay close to him, take his yoke. Now, the yoke is the attachment that two oxen are put together with so that they can plow together. If you'll get equally yoked with Jesus, it'll be a good life. If you're unequally yoked with Jesus, it won't be good. You'll be dragging through the dirt. You ever felt like a Christian dragging through the dirt? It's because you didn't uh, step up and let yourself get yoked. You might believe in him, but you need to take his yoke upon you so that you do it his way and follow him. And if he's doing it, you're doing it. If he's saying it, you're saying it. If he's thinking it, you're thinking it. If his attitude is this, then your attitude is this. So uh, taking his yoke upon you uh, is how you get rest. You find rest for your soul if you'll just hook up to him. You'll still have to walk by faith. You'll still have to live this life. You'll still have to tread the corn. You'll still have to plow the field with him. There's a little effort involved in this walk. But if you'll take his yoke, you'll have rest the whole time doing it. It doesn't mean rest that you just sleep and do nothing. It's not just a passiveness that you kind of coast through life because you got saved once. That's not what we're talking about. A lot of Christians take it that way. And they think they got saved, and now, now God's in control of my life, so whatever happens is his will. No, he needs you involved in his will. Amen. He needs you to know his will, believe his will. So we've covered that a bunch so that you don't just live by that false tag of God's in control. Everything that happens, he's in control. If he, if he didn't want it to happen to me, it wouldn't have happened. You can't think that way. You can't think that way. He needs you to be prepared for adversity. He's not giving you adversity. He needs you to be prepared. And the first way you prepare is you yoke to Jesus. You'll have rest through the storm. Amen. All right. So <clears throat> go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 tells us that to get the rest, there is, there is something required. So I've already described that you have to willingly attach to Jesus. You have to willingly yoke to him. Okay, how do you do that? Well, it's more than just obey uh, you need to learn. That's what he said. Come and learn of me. If you're, lab- if you're laboring heavy laden, come learn of me. Uh, so you got to learn. And then after you learn, you got you to believe. So you got to learn, believe, and then you got to obey. Uh, but let's see how Hebrews says it. Hebrews chapter 3, verse... What? 3. It's 4, but I backed it up because... I'm not going by my notes, backing it up. So here's a scripture from the Old Testament that's referring to the children of Israel who got stuck in the wilderness. There's a reason why they got stuck in the wilderness. God didn't send them into the wilderness for 40 years. They, they, they sent themselves in there because of something very critical, very crucial, very, uh, very bad. You're about to see very evil. Uh, and it's because they didn't believe God. But look at the scripture that's from the Old Testament, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me. It's not God testing us, it's us testing him. And saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they've not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, you don't have to experience the wrath of God because we are saved from wrath through Christ, Romans 5, 9. But they, they did have to be afraid of his wrath, and they couldn't enter the rest because of his wrath. 
Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So notice this term, evil heart of unbelief. If, it's, if you can't believe God's word, that's kind of evil. Okay? So think of it as something very, very harmful, very wrong, very evil for you to not believe something fully. Use that as a motivator to start believing it better. Amen. You've heard it in church, believe it. The things that maybe you sit there and you're kind of like, oh, I don't really, that's too hard for me. That's going to be too hard for me. I'm not sure that I can actually give my whole life. I'm not sure that I can actually do that. or I'm not sure if I can actually believe for a real miracle of healing. Okay, I'm not trying to condemn you, but recognize, wait a second, I need to go ahead and start believing that. If it's in the Bible, you've got to believe this. You don't want to fall in this category. Now, God's not going to make you die in the wilderness, but if you're going to get his help, you're going to have to change. Flip the switch, you're going to have to start believing. You can go from unbelief to belief if you're willing. Now, he's talking about departing from the living God. I know you're not going to necessarily depart from the living God. Now, some people do. Some people allow themselves to disbelieve so much that they grew up believing, and then now they don't believe, that happens. That happens to people. They grew up in church, and then they became, you know, uh, a prideful college kid and decided they know better than everybody in the world plus God, and they leave God. Well, I know you're not going to do that, but don't leave even in the smaller things. Don't leave even in the life instructional things or the promises of God we have to believe. All right. Verse 18, and to whom did he swear that he would not, excuse me, to, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? That word obey is also the same word for believe. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. If you believe, you will obey. I mean, if you really believe, you're going to show it, right? If you really believe in combing your hair, your hair's combed. If you really believe in taking showers, people will sit next to you at church. We can always tell when you don't believe in showers or baths. We can always tell by what your lifestyle is. If you believe in having a clean car on the inside, then there are no french fries in there. Right, like right now, there are no french fries anywhere in the car if you believe in having a clean car. So we could see that they could not enter in. You can't enter into the rest because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word that they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Believing will help you enter the place of rest so that you can have a peaceful existence, so that you can feel confident enough to sleep in the storm as long as there's a pillow. But you have to believe. What happened when Jesus was woken up from his nap in the storm, on the boat, on the pillow? What did he say? They said, don't you care, master? We're perishing. He said, Oh, you have little faith. See, he had faith to take a nap. If you have faith, if you believe God's word and God's promises, then you can just rest through this life. We're not talking about you ignoring trouble. We're talking about you have, you've put all of your concern onto the Lord and trusted him, knowing he will preserve you, knowing he will direct you, knowing he will help you avoid you know, some catastrophe, knowing that he will save you from the sharks, knowing he will do it. I mean, if you ever get stranded in the ocean, you can be safe from sharks. Now, some of you avoid the ocean because you don't want to even have to think about that. But those of us who spend time in the ocean, I have to think about it every year. Every year I'm in the ocean. I'm an ocean guy. I'm a beach guy. And every time I'm, I'm out there thinking, I know there's tons of sharks out here because I catch them all the time. And in my heart and mind, I have to make sure my faith is there. If I feel a little intimidated because I caught three sharks this big and I'm still standing out there in this deep water, wow. I have to exercise my faith. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not, 
No need to be afraid. I'm not afraid. I refuse to be. Oh, no, I am not afraid. I rebuke every shark out here. I rebuke every, nothing can touch me. I mean, you do have to put some effort into making sure you believe things. Because if you have intimidation, you're at risk. I think you're at risk. So I've told this before, but it's a funny story. So one year I was out in the surf. So when you fish in the, in the, in the surf out there um, for speckled trout and stuff, uh, you get a weight fish out there somewhere from this deep to this deep. So the taller you are, the deeper you can go. But you don't always have to go deep, but just about this deep. And I was out there weight fishing and uh, catching some speckled trout, and it was kind of fun. And, but there was tons of cabbage heads out there. You know what a cabbage head is? It's a cabbage head. That's what we call some of these types of jellyfish. Now, they're not the jellyfish that have the long tentacles. Those are man o' wars or, or other type jellyfish that really sting. Those tentacles will really nail you. But these are just cabbage heads. And so they're about this big. And on the underneath of them, you ever seen a cabbage head? You can pick a cabbage head up from the top. It's real slimy. It's kind of fun to hold those and throw them at each other. But you pick them up. But on the underside, it looks like a cabbage. And that's why they call it that. And, and, but it has a little bit of poison in it, a little bit of sting to it. Like if you touch yourself with that underneath side, uh, it's, it, it'll sting you just a little bit, not terribly. And uh, so, you, so it's okay to be out there with the cabbage heads. It's not really, but there were thousands of them everywhere, thousands of them. And it's usually really no problem. But in this case, uh, I was kind of deep. And so I could see these cabbage heads all around me and I didn't, I wasn't thinking much of it. And then all of a sudden one got close to me and the wave, it was kind of wavy. So the wave would turn them and they would sting me. Ah, like, wow. Ah. And then I, then I could, then I could tell I was a little uh, concerned. Here comes one, here comes one. Oh. And I got tired of being scared. And I realized, wait a second, wait a second. I'm just going to take it. I have authority over this thing. Now, some people say, yeah, you could have just got out. <laughs> but I wanted to fish. I had a plan. And so I made a decision. I said, wait a second, wait a second. I take authority over these things. I refuse to be stung by these things. You cannot touch me. Don't sting me in Jesus' name. And I kept fishing. And I, and I fished in faith and nothing touched me. And nothing touched me. And nothing touched me. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, having a great time. And then I kind of saw one out of the corner of my eye getting close and getting close and getting close. And I started worrying. I started worrying. I'm like, oh. And then boom, it stung me. I'm like, oh. You see my fight? Now I recognized I have to fight to believe. My faith, I have to fight the fear and the intimidation. So then I found myself overcoming the mountain. By refusing to be afraid. I could see him coming. I'm like, I ain't afraid of you. I ain't afraid. I ain't afraid of you. I ain't afraid of you. And they never touched me again. Okay? Fear will always just negate your faith. Concern will negate your faith. Worry will negate your faith. Got it? So there is a certain fight to believe. You do have to overcome your soul, your internal distress. You have to overcome that if you're going to be in faith for something. Make sense? So we're not talking about you just kind of, oh, I'm not going to worry about anything. Well, say that after you've believed. But you can see that sometimes there's a few steps of faith you got to take in your fight. It's not just one switch that turns on forever and ever. Like if I went out there again and had the same conditions, I would have to get my soul back over this, maybe, I mean, maybe not, but my soul might have to uh, re-believe in the moment of crisis. Hallelujah. Then, so you got all these great needs in life. Uh, we all have great needs in life. So you got to believe the promises of God. Yes. And then you got to rest. Because if you really believe, you will enter the rest. So that's one way that you know you're in faith is when you can really enter into that place of, I'm, I'm at total peace. I'm not worried about it. I've entered the rest. How do I know? I believed. I feel it. I sense it. I know that God's got this. I'm not afraid. Isn't that wonderful? <clears throat> one of the Psalms says, wait patiently for the Lord. Wait patiently for the Lord. <clears throat> rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. 
Rest in the Lord. You got to find a way to rest in the Lord regarding promises. Not just blindly ignore problems, but rest in the Lord based on his promises. So we're not talking about just passive, close your eyes and act like nothing's wrong. Um, It's like that joke I've told before. Three men died, went to hell. One was a Baptist, one was a Catholic. Remember this? One was a Baptist, one was a Catholic, one was a faith guy. And they both, they all three died and they went to hell. <clears throat> and they're in hell and they're standing next to each other and like, what happened? Why are you here? The Catholic guy says, I don't know why I'm here. I, I got sprinkled as a baby. <laughs> they looked at the Baptist guy and said, why are you here? He says, I don't know. I went down. They told me to come down and shake the preacher's hand. <clears throat> they looked at the faith guy and they said, why are you here? He goes, I'm not here. So, obviously, all three of them are in hell because they did not receive Jesus as Lord. It's the only way you would go to hell. Uh, But that is not what real faith is, just denying the problem or ignoring the problem or acting like... Faith requires a belief and an action and and some corresponding proof. So don't, don't... Because, hey, look, the message of faith has been preached and people act like that. People act like that. They, they jump the believing part and the rest part over into the I'm not going to think about it part. And then they don't have any success with God. They don't have any answered prayer. And then they fall flat. And people are like, what happened? I thought you were believing God. Well, they, they weren't real honest with what they've sensed in their heart. So you do have to get real honest on the inside and know for sure. you got to know for sure about your own self. I was out there fishing, dealing with myself. You're dealing with yourself. I don't care what people think. You're dealing with your own self. Never underestimate that, that your soul is a little bit complex in there, right? Like when you're, when you're a kid, you got like two or three wires and they're pretty clean. But as you get older, you got a ball of all tangled up electrical wiring on the inside of you. Isn't that right? And it's kind of difficult to untangle that. So you got to get the word in you to untangle all that wiring so that you know what you know and know what you don't know. And then you've got to be real honest inside your soul uh, where you're at with God's word, God's promises, your relationship with the Lord, your connection to the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. All this helps. The word and tongues help. Uh, It's the only way to get those wires figured out. Some of those wires are damaged. Some of those wires are, are kinked and cut and chipped and hurt and all this stuff from your past. Some of them are just discouraged wires. They're crossing over everything. Some of these are trauma from your childhood wires, and they're messing up the whole thing on the inside. And only you know that. Only you know that about yourself. You and God's the only ones that know, don't know that wiring. And you might not even be fully aware of it, so you have to uh, work through it. You, gotta work, you have to walk this faith out. That's called the fight, the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith is to identify some things on the inside of your soul so that you can believe God better. Just go after a promise. And you don't have to figure it out psychologically. Listen, please don't go the psychological route. That'll just dive you deeper into hopelessness. Nobody can, no, no human can fix that stuff in there. It's just too, too messed up. It's like when you go fishing and you get a, we call it a bird's nest. If you don't cast right, the, the line will get all tangled up in certain reels. And it's like, oh, you can't get some of it. Sometimes you can't get it out. Now, some of us pros can always get it out. <laughs> and then some of us are so determined that we'll spend 30 minutes. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose this one. I'm not going to lose this fight. <clears throat> but every once in a while, it's impossible. And so what you got to do is just throw that whole thing out. <laughs> you just got to throw that whole thing out. It's impossible. Well, that's what we are. We're impossible to fix psychologically. Okay. So we're going to have to get the word and the spirit and start um, moving on from our disappointments and discouragements by casting our cares to the Lord, allowing him to heal us so that we know that we have a bird's nest in our fishing reel. We know that we got some troubles, but I'm going to stand on the promise of God anyway. And I'm going to uh, uh, verbally relinquish all my inside turmoil to the Lord. And I'm going to believe God. And I'm going to fight to believe God. And I'm going to keep quoting the scripture. And I'm going to get determined on the inside so that my spirit man can fully rejoice. 
If you're trying to believe God for a job or money or health or relationships or something for your kids or your family or your spouse, whatever you got, then your goal is to get to that place where your spirit man stands up and says, I win. On the inside, he's like, glory to God. Everything's going to be just fine. And then we'll know, not that we have to know, but we'll know because your attitude's all, all good now. You'll know because you can smile in the mirror. Amen? Uh, one of the ways we describe it is you're not in faith until you cheer up. Just a real simple evidence for you to know. You're not really in faith yet until you cheer up. Good word. So your faith can help you know for sure if you're in faith or not. If it looks like this, you're not in faith yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're going to enter his rest. And then uh, I had in my notes here. Uh, don't let the devil have any rest in you. Sometimes people that didn't go through the faith process, didn't really believe, they're just chilling out, and the devil is chilling out with them. So don't let the devil chill out with you. you you got to catch the devil, kick him out. You know, he, he's cast out, and he walks around seeking, he's seeking rest. He walks about, remember when the demon's cast out, he walks about dry places seeking rest and finds none, comes back to the house that we was cast out from, comes back in, takes more with him, it's worse than the first, right? So don't let the devil have rest in you. Just like, no, 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 no. If you need rest, demon, you go somewhere else. I know some pigs and some squirrels out front. You go rest in, you go rest in them squirrels. We have some demonized squirrels out there. That mess, they're messing up our, our couch cushions out there. So <laughs> July 4th, <clears throat> July 4th, no, we can't wait that long. <clears throat> July 4th, we'll, we'll be letting off some real booms. <laughs> no, no, he says, no, we can't do that. Okay. <clears throat> he, he's right. He's right. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right. Is everybody resting in the Lord now? Yes. Praise the Lord. I'll just uh, mention this. Okay, so we all want to have this good life. We want to have a closeness to God. Yes. We want to have answers. We want to have God speak to us. Amen. And really a lot of this has to do with you and the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to get close to the Holy Spirit. Uh, people want comfort, but without the comforter, there's no comfort. So you're not, you're, our life requires that we get close to the comforter. Therefore, you've got to get saved so you can have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you've got to get filled with the Spirit so you can pray in the Spirit so that you can maintain some comfort in your life. You won't have any comfort without the Holy Spirit. You just won't have it. It'll be temporary if you do. Uh, sometimes people get, get a great you know, uh, deal come through or a great job or a great, oh, I got married. And wow, man, this is so great and wonderful and everything. But it doesn't last forever. Your comfort can only last if you have the comforter. He's the replacement for all of the world's anxieties. The comforter is the replacement for alcohol and all sorts of mind-altering everything and mind-numbing everything. The, the comforter is, is the replacement for all that. Sure did get quiet in here. Okay? Listen. The, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, is the way that you make it through this earth. Yeah, and if you do not get close to the Holy Spirit in a real faith relationship with him, you can't see him, you can't always feel him. It's a faith relationship with him. So close that you can hear his voice, so close that you can receive all that he's giving. If you don't get that, man, you're gonna, you'll be a frustrated Christian because you'll never have the real comfort. And eventually you'll start dabbling with the comfort from the world. Whatever the world can comfort you in, and, and people do it all the time, from the drugs to the, you know, it could be media, it could be whatever that comforts you. You have to, you have to catch that and say, wait a second, I really need to go get my comfort from the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. There's an alt, that's the replacement. 
And if you're not going to get filled with the Spirit and spend time with the Holy Spirit, do what you want. Do what you want. Okay, don't do what you want. <laughs> but you get my point, right? The pastor said I could do what I want. I did not. I took it back. I was making a point that I'm, I can't help you. I really can't help you if you're going to do, do what you want. Really, God can't help you if you're going to do what you want. Amen. Amen. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is impossible without the Holy Spirit. Impo completely impossible without being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. You will never be spiritually minded. Amen. Have you ever heard somebody say that out there? I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. I've got, I got these little statues here and I've got these little things here and I do this little funny thing here. And You're not spiritual. No. You're not spiritual. You're demonized what you are. The only way to be spiritual is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk with God by his word. Only way. Only way. To be spiritual. If you're truly spiritually minded, you'll have life and peace. That's a reality. So if you don't have life and peace today, you're not being spiritually minded. You have stepped away somehow from the reality of the Holy Spirit within and the Word of God that gives life to you. And, and you're not yoked to Jesus. All those things are the problem if you don't have life and peace today. I'm not on you. I don't, I don't know who's not having life and peace. I'm just saying if. Make sense? So you've got to judge your own life and, and, and know the solution for it. Uh, turn to Psalm 17. Psalm 17, <clears throat> I would say this, that if, uh, to maintain life and peace and comfort and all that, you're going to have to find a way to live satisfied. You're going to have to live satisfied. Like what would it take to satisfy you? What would it take to satisfy you in this life? How could you possibly be content right now? What does it take for you to be totally satisfied and content in this very moment? What is it that your spirit or your soul is uneasy about and always feeling like I'm not there yet? Address those things. Usually it's some sort of ambition, a desire, or a lack, and you feel like if I just had that lack filled, I'd be, I'd be fine, I'd be satisfied if I could finally just get over the hump from week-to-week -week income, stuff like that. What is it that your soul is just never satisfied in? You identify that and then fight it with some truth. Because there's a way to live satisfied every day of your life. Even though there's lack, even though things aren't done yet, even though there's future that you haven't achieved, uh, you can't get stuck in the, in the rat race. Isn't that what they call it? All right. Uh, Psalm 17 Here's a couple things to be satisfied with. Really, you can just be satisfied with being saved. That's all? Well, that's kind of a big deal. How about this? All that salvation comes with it. We're not talking about just going to heaven. We're talking about all that salvation comes with it. How about union with God? Life with the Holy Ghost? How about all the promises of God are yours? How about you're seated with him in heavenly places. How about you have authority over all devils and demons and evil in the earth? How about all the other promises of God? How about everything that salvation brings with it? You find a way to get content in there, get satisfied in there. <clears throat> Here's one you can be satisfied with. Why don't you just be satisfied with being right with God? I want you to not only be right with God, I want you to feel it. If you've ever felt righteousness, man, it's the best feeling in the world to just sit there totally accepted in the arms of God. I, I, it's the best feeling in the whole world. That's all you need. Isn't that all you need? People keep waiting for heaven where I'm just in the arms of God. Well, you can have that today. Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, David said this, and he said it before anybody could be born again. He, he had some insight that most Christians don't even have today. We could, but he said this, as for me, I, I will see your face in righteousness. 
I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. David said, I'll be satisfied if I can just wake up like God. If I can wake up being right with God, if I can wake up with his nature and, and, and his character and in his likeness, I'll be satisfied. Will you be? The more you can exemplify Christ and walk with God and, and let him impart his life to you, the more satisfied you'll be in this earth. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 37 says, Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. Now, we know you're not blameless in the area of never sinned, but you could live a lifestyle of not sinning and be called blameless. But because of the blood of Jesus, you are blameless and you're upright. And if your lifestyle can, can get close to those two words, then you'll feel it more often because God has made you right. He has given you righteousness, justified you through the blood of Jesus. Mark that man. Mark those righteous Christians and observe the upright for the future of that man is peace. So if you get upright with God, you'll have peace in your life. And then you learn how to be satisfied with the peace that comes with it. Praise the Lord. Go to Psalm 85. These are a lot of the Old Testament scriptures that you package them up together and you bring them over into the kingdom of God and you realize from Romans 14, 17 that the kingdom of God is described. This whole kingdom of God that we live in, that lives in us, uh, that we've entered into by salvation through Christ alone, the whole kingdom of God is wrapped up with these three words. What are they? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not your outward religious activity. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We bring these Old Testament truths through the cross. That's what they look like. But notice one of these attributes here. Uh, Psalm 85 verse 10 says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. What does that mean? That means peace is real close to righteousness. Like how close? Like they're kissing. That means if you could just get right with God, you'd have peace in your life. If you could just live right with God, you'd have peace in your life every day. Your goal is not to get peace. Your goal is to get righteous. Oh, wait, you already got saved, so you are righteous. He was made sin for us. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are made righteous. Before you acted righteous, you were made righteous. Because you're made righteous, now you have peace. Comes, it's a package deal. They're kissing. I've never seen an art piece of righteousness and peace kissing, but it would be pretty cool. <laughs> Isaiah uh, chapter 32 Let's read that one. Go to Isaiah chapter 32. No, don't go painting that. We don't need that. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 32. Just get it written on your heart. That's all you need. Isaiah 32 verse 17. The work, or we can read 16 and 17. They kind of go together. The justice will dwell in the wilderness. Uh, actually, this is talking about when... Jesus ascends and the Spirit comes. When the Spirit comes, these things happen. Verse 15 says, until the Spirit is poured out. Verse 16, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and assurance forever. See that? The effect of righteousness is quietness. If you want your soul to be quiet, Major on how right you are with God. That's why when sinners first get saved, they lived with turmoil and disquietness in their heart their entire life. They get saved and it's like, wow, how wonderful. And then after six years, 
Sometimes they're all discombobulated again, only because they haven't majored on it, only because they haven't put some faith in their righteousness, and they've been kind of contaminated with the world and all sorts of fears and worries and, you know, non-spiritual lifestyle. Non-spiritual lifestyle will rob you of this quietness. So you need to chill out, you need to turn things off, you need to not go the world's way, and you need to major on how right you are with God. And you'll have some quiet life and a wonderful life. Even if there's loud kids in the house, you can still have a quiet life. Uh, Isaiah 54, I'll just quote this. The mountains shall depart, hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. So there's this aspect that the covenant includes straight peace from God into our hearts. Glory to God. Uh, so don't be satisfied. Be satisfied with righteousness. Don't be satisfied with unrighteousness. Proverbs 14 Verse 7 says, the backslider in heart, 7 through 14 says, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. So if you're backslidden, you won't be satisfied. Slide back up. Lamentations 120 is a very sad book. He says, I'm in distress. My bowels are troubled my heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Rebellion against God will cause distress in your heart. Praise the Lord. Another scripture in Isaiah 57 says, there's no peace for the wicked. There's no peace for the wicked. So your lifestyle is going to have to straighten up according to the yoke with Jesus as part of it. If you yoke with him, you'll have rest for your soul. See, it all puts together pretty easily. The difficulty is that you got to leave the world's ways and you got to leave the world's enticements and you can't be satisfied with the lust of the world. Remember, there's a scripture that says the eyes of man are never satisfied. The, the lust of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those are destructive to us. But the hearing of the ears and the seeing of the eyes is never satisfied. Hence, social media is still there. People can't get enough. Why, why is this? Like, man, well, why do I have to? Because your eyes are never satisfied. Your ears want to hear the next thing. That's why the music industry is going to continue for the rest of eternity. Because people want to hear the next song. I mean, don't we have enough good songs? No, you got to hear the next song. We're it's just a, it's an amazing aspect of the human life that the eyes and ears are never satisfied. You have to, you have to guard against needing more from the world. That always brings quietness in the church. How about this? How about being satisfied with his goodness? Jeremiah 31, 14 says, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. Are you? <clears throat> Psalm 65, 4 says the same thing. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. <clears throat> you can be satisfied with the fruit of your mouth. Go to Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. You know where Proverbs is in the Bible? It's right in the middle. It's right next to Psalms. Which comes first, Psalms or Proverbs? Psalms. How do you know? Psalms come, first. <laughs> Psalms come first because we always sing first in church. That's how you know, singing before preaching. So Psalm before Proverbs. It's not a rule. It's just a fact. Proverbs 12, verse 13, says, The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Wow. You'll be satisfied with good in life by the fruit of your lips, by the fruit of your mouth. What does that mean? That means you better, if you'll talk right, you'll be satisfied in life. Have you ever noticed how when you don't talk right, things go south? You who are married, have you recognized when the words out of your mouth aren't real wholesome? What it does to the relationship? It's weird, isn't it? It's very real. So just hold back all those unwholesome words and you'll be satisfied today. And when your spouse says, honey, I want to talk. 
Okay. Plan what you're about to say. <laughs> How was your day? If, if nothing good happened in the day, you don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I do that with, with my wife. You know, it's like stuff goes on in the day, in the week, and whatever. And uh, I hold back a lot of it because I don't want to rehearse something that wasn't wholesome. I just hold it back. Now, if it's needful for her to know as pastor of the church and stuff like that, we'll, we'll discuss it and I'll bring it up. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that I've never told her that was bad news from around the world. And I just hold it back. If she's watching this, she's thinking, what? And it's just stuff that I don't want to taint her with stuff that I know that's not great. Right? Think about people before you start just, you know, rehearsing the news of the day and how mad you are at the whole wide world all the time. Think about how it's going to affect people when you say something. You'll be a lot more satisfied in life if you can just be a black hole and let it just disappear. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Can you keep a secret? You know who you are out there. A secret? Tell me. It's an enticement. I, I want to hear more. I got to hear the next guy. I got to hear the next. Uh, here's how, maybe this is a little stretch. If you like to watch those, uh, those documentaries of all the terrible, th uh, be careful because that's a seed that's going to help you share gossip with others. If you watch it, hey, did you see that on the so-and-so that happened? And, then, and now you're spreading weird stuff about other people. Might be true, but it's not wholesome. Okay, but no, we don't do that. We're talking about other people in other places that might do that. Proverbs 18, verse 20. Proverbs 18, verse 20 says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. What an odd way to say it. Your stomach is satisfied by what you say. I mean, it's a lot more satisfied if you say good things at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. What's it saying? It's saying the, in, the inside of you, your heart, the inside of you will be satisfied from the fruit of your mouth. So if you can be a wholesome talker, if you can bridle your tongue, hold back stuff that doesn't need to be said or addressed, you'll be satisfied. Praise the Lord. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Eat its fruit. Eat the fruit of your tongue. Can you imagine something about you saying right things create good things in your life that you get to partake of and enjoy, be satisfied with? You can be satisfied with God's word. I'll just quote a couple. Uh, if you'll give attention to the word and love the word, never forget the word. Uh, with long life, length of days, and peace, they'll add to you these words. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy word. It says law, but love thy word and nothing shall offend them. The more you love God's word, the less offended you will be at everything that goes wrong in your life. And if you're getting offended and miffed at a lot of things in life, you're not loving this enough. How does that correlate? Well, because this tells you how to be. And it tells you how to walk in love. And it tells you how to overlook people's sins. It tells you that love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that wonderful? And then all these other wonderful truths that help you feel confident and secure and wonderful, no matter what's going on in your life. Great peace have they which love thy law. Uh, Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. I slipped over into the King James. Uh, the fear of the Lord. You can be satisfied with the fear of the Lord. You have respect and honor toward God. It's just another way to say that you obey and are yoked to Jesus in every way, that you really care deeply about that. That would be the fear of the Lord, that I care deeply to stay connected to Jesus in life and lifestyle. Belief, life, lifestyle, all those things, that would be called the fear of the Lord in a way. 
It says the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord tends to life and he that has it shall abide satisfied. He'll not be visited with evil. Wow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit satisfied. How about you? Praise the Lord. God's given us a way to access this wonderful kingdom of God where you can have peace in your life, be satisfied the rest of the days of your life. Like right now, today, it doesn't matter how much you need, you can be satisfied. There are times when you are kind of desperately seeking a miracle or an answer. That's okay. But don't plan on staying there very long. And even if you're there, make sure that you find a way to be in rest while you're there. God will bring it to pass. Trust in the Lord. So this is all reality. So you and I can partake of this covenant with God, walk closely with him, enjoy the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are y'all enjoying the Holy Spirit yet? Do y'all have a daily relationship with the Holy Spirit? You praying in tongues a lot? All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining Pastors Chaz and Joni today from Houston Faith Church. If you're looking for a good home church in Houston, Texas, we'd like to invite you to be our guest anytime. What you'll find is that Houston Faith Church is highly committed to the Word of God, the love of God, and the Spirit-filled life and ministry that Jesus expects. We know that everyone wants to make a difference in this life, and that the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ is the main thing for all of us. You'll find your purpose here and grow strong in faith at Houston Faith Church. Find more faith-building resources on our YouTube channel or subscribe to our free audio podcast. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you soon.